Hello, welcome to Mirror Talk. My name is Kaeza Fern, and I'm the Director of Communications at Mirror. We're so glad to be getting together for another Mirror Talk, and I am excited that we'll be hearing from our guest speaker, David Spratt. After that, we'll have a question and discussion period with a few people from the wider Mir community. And then we'll open it up for some questions from all of you in our audience. Before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that we are at Mir, have, we have Mir exper experiments going on. And we're so appreciative of any donations you can make to support the experimental materials. If you can make a monthly donation, that would be fantastic. You can go to mirror.org forward slash donate. And thank you so much to those of you who are contributing. Please write to community at mirror.org if you want to be in touch. And now I will tell you about David Spratt. David Spratt is a research director for Breakthrough National Center for Climate Restoration, Melbourne, and co-author of Climate Code Red, The Case for Emergency Action and What Lies Beneath the Underestimation of Existential Climate Risk. If anyone has any questions that come up while David is presenting, you can send them to Eric, Eric with a K in the chat, and Eric should be showing up as a co-host. Okay, David, we are so interested to hear what you have to say about Climate 2022. Hey, so thank you very much, and thank you for everybody uh, for joining the show. Um, I'm just going to share a screen for a short period of time, and then I'll get rid of it. So... Is that good? Okay, is that good? Um, great. So about a month ago, we put out a short paper called Faster, Higher, Hotter, having a bit of a look at climate science in 2022, which we shouldn't have to do because we should all be aware of what the science has said, but that's often not the case. Uh, it was called What We Learned About the Climate System in 2022, or it could have been called The Case for Communicating the Need for Cooling. Um, but I went with Faster, Higher, Hotter because I thought it would attract a a wider audience. Um, these sort of discussions, which are fairly brutal and frank about the physical realities, often devolve into discussion about hope and fear and so on. So I just want to start with um, uh, uh, a quote I came across recently in a in Rebecca Solnit's Orwell's Roses book from Octavia Butler, in which she says, the very act of trying to look ahead and to discern possibilities and offer warnings is in, is in itself an act of hope, which I think really encapsulates some of the work that I'm trying to do. So just a little bit of context for what I'm going to say and some of where it's come from. Um, and the question is how in trying to understand the science do we unwind, unwind the dangerous interactions and interplay between science and politics, which we see in the IPCC, including the report last week. Uh, and this comes back to a, um, a book uh, I co-authored co in 2008 called Climate Code Red, which essentially made three propositions. And remember back then we were talking about 450 parts per million and two degrees. Um, nobody was really talking about tipping points. The IPCC was saying that Antarctica would be stable for a thousand years. Uh, the science out there was saying that Greenland would be stable till two and a half degrees. And we said, uh, and in fact, just asked me before we wrote this book, there was a, a large melting event of Arctic sea ice and a leading sea ice scientist said, ah, the Arctic is melting 100 years ahead of schedule. And our response was, no, the scientific understanding is 100 years behind the reality. So we said three things in the book, really. The physical stand circumstances are worse than policymakers understand. The second was that two degrees was simply the wrong target. But what was really safe was um, no more than 325 parts per million or half a degree, which is the Holocene maximum, that within the Holocene range, systems will be stable. As soon as we got out of the Holocene range, systems will be unstable. And that, within a few years, was proven for West Antarctica. Uh, and we said that because of those goals, uh, 
three actions were needed. Uh, radical mitigation, drawdown, and ge what was then called geoengineering, now core climate intervention. So we've been in that space for a long time. And the third thing was that this required an emergency mobilization similar to a war effort. That is where climate becomes the first priority of, of um, both politics and economics. And I think those three propositions have probably been proved to be correct in the 15 years since. The second thing is a report in 2017 called What Lies Beneath about the underestimation of existential climate risk, in which it said that climate uh, policy making was embedded in a uh, culture of failure and that the risks were existential and required uh, a new approach to risk management, which I'll come back to. Uh, and in fact, I mean, those sort of ideas actually got picked up. So people like Rockstrom and Sheldon Hoover and so on, you know, two years later, uh, put out a paper called Tipping Points Too Risky to Bet Against. It really echoed uh, what we've been, been saying in that paper. So um, in What Lies Beneath, a Ford was written by John Sheldon Hoover, um, who just at that time in an interview with Nick Brees had said, when the issue is the survival of civilization, conventional means of analysis and immense scientific analysis may become useless, which I think is a really powerful statement about the sort of scientific tools we need. And in, in the forward to what lies beneath, he wrote that calculating probabilities makes little sense in the most critical instances of system feedbacks. Rather, we should look at the high end possibilities. That is, it is not the middle of the road outcomes that matters, but it's the it's the plausible worst case scenarios that must be must be addressed. And that's the essence of existential risk management. Um, and uh, I mean, this is this is still a problem with the IPCC, including the report last week, where you get carbon budgets with a 33 to 50 percent chance of failure. That is a one or two or one in three chance of failure. So they'll say, we have got so many tons of a carbon budget to two degrees with a 50% chance. What that's actually saying is there's a 50% chance of going past two degrees. And in fact, the carbon budget with a 50% chance of two degrees has a 10% chance of four degrees, which is the end of civilization, not the species, but of civilization. So embedded in the IPC are risks of failure huge risk of failure that we, we would not accept in our own lives. I mean, whether it's car seats or buildings or aeroplanes, the risks of failure are tiny fractions of 1%. And that's the way it should be. But we have with the IPC and, and carbon budgets, the incorporation into the core business of policymaking, uh, threats of failure to the, to, to the earth system, to civilization that we wouldn't accept in our own lives, which really to me, uh, ask questions about the efficacy of the IPCC. I mean, carbon budgets are, are a consequence of catastrophic risk management failure. If you have low risk, those carbon budgets simply do not exist. And this is this is the problem. So I just want to start with a few charts before I turn this PowerPoint off. That sort of I found gobsmacking in, in the last uh, few weeks. One is this from the, the uh, US... Um, Energy Administration on projected carbon dioxide emissions from energy for US for the next 50 years. And you can see here in, in the next 30 years, it's going from there to there, which is a drop of about 15% by 2050, not exactly net zero. And this is the, this is the US government's views. The second is this chart uh, from Wood McKenzie in the Financial Times of expected uh, liquid national liquid uh, natural gas liquef liquefaction capacity that is export capacity over the next um, uh, ten years, and you can see, in particular with the U.S., the figure is really shooting up. And if you put just those three type exporters, and Australia is one of them, what it's saying is between 2020 and 2030, the amount of LNG exported around the world from those three is going to double. I mean, this is a huge expansion of the gas industry. The third and perhaps the most gobsmacking is this chart that Jim Hansen and others have shown. And people know that um, three years ago, there were new regulations that basically cut um, sulfur 
out of uh, bunker fuel. So shipping, uh, shipping emissions uh, no longer have sulfur in it. So the gray line shows the amount of um, sulfur dioxide from shipping emissions. And you can see in 29 and 20, it dropped from um, to almost zero. And of course, sulfur, as we know, is a, is a short-term cooling agent. Sulfates have a large amount of, 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 of short-term cooling in the atmosphere. Um, and as a consequence, it would seem of, of that drop in shipping sulfate emissions, the energy, Earth's energy imbalance, which is really a measure of future warming to come at the top of the atmosphere, went from under one watt per meter to four watts per meter over the North Atlantic, North America and, uh, and North Pacific, which are the shipping zones. Now, one to four watts per square meter, an increase of three watts per square meter, is a, is a bit more than two degrees of warming that is yet to be revealed because of the drop in sulfates. Now, on a global level, um, that's probably half a degree. So what we can see is that the drop in sulfur, in sulfur emissions in, in, in active cooling uh, as a consequence of, of shipping using fossil fuels is another half a degree of warming to come. I mean, that's, that's a shocking thing. And, and you know, Jim Hansen for years has been talking about whether aerosol forcing is is higher or lower you know half to three quarters a degree or more than a degree and um i think this probably shows that he was right that it was high that's high that there's probably more than a degree of warming being masked by 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 short-term sulfate emissions if cutting out shipping emissions alone uh reveals half a degree of warming uh the next one is is from jim hansen's december um newsletter where he projects future warming. You can see that yellow band going above the green line, which was the linear fit. And he says increased earth energy imbalance, which is what we're just talking about, is the basis for our projection that warming will increase by as much as 50 to 100% in the next few decades. So he and, and others, um, Ramanathan and saying there will be increased um, uh, levels of warming. And if you look at 2040, you can see in Jim's chart that 2040 is about there. It's about 1.8 to 2.2 in the range of, um, of, of warming in 20 years time. Um, so as I said, we did this paper uh, looking at, at some recent data from last year, what the science was saying. It's about 1.5, it's about two, it's about the likelihood of three. Um, it's about tipping points happening faster than forecast and being nonlinear and therefore the case for cooling. So um, at that point, I will stop sharing um, and um, just talk a little bit about that paper uh, in more detail. So I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go through it um, one by one. Um, the first is, is emissions. Now, whether you look at the International Energy Agency or the UNFCCC, it is clear that emissions are still increasing. Um, and in fact, UNFCCC had projections where they said in 2030, emissions will be 50% higher than 1990 and probably 0.3% lower than in 2019. And as I said, indicating the possibility that global emissions will peak before 2030. So what, we, what we're seeing is emissions probably still increasing for the rest of this decade and then plateauing. Uh, the second thing is the question of 1.5, which is problematic and has been in policy making circles because people keep on talking about keeping warming under 1.5. But I mean, it's clear uh, all around that we are going to hit 1.5 towards the end of this decade as a trend. Um, the latest IPCC report even admits that. People have been saying it for years, Jim Hansen and Will Steffen. So uh, without immediate and direct cooling of the system, there is no chance of warming not bursting through 1.5 uh, within a decade or so. So the, the, the policy making somewhat delusional discussion about 1.5 is really about overshoot scenarios, that is going to two or two and a half degrees, um, and then cooling back to 1.5 by the end of the century. But this is often not made explicit. They will say, oh, we still have a carbon budget for 1.5, but it's actually a carbon budget for 1.5 overshoot. Um, in the paper, we look at a, a really good long Washington Post analysis that looked at 1,200 1.5 scenarios and found none of them were actually kept the system under 1.5 
without speculative assumptions uh, about technologies that would be available. And I think the, the really big problem, which really hasn't been talked about at all, is that uh, we're getting feedbacks in the system now by, by 1.5 and between 1.5 and 2 degrees, as Will Stefan and many others have said, there are going to be significant feedbacks in the system and even the possibility of, of triggering the hothouse circumstances. So there's hysteresis in the system that means getting from 1.5 to 2 it's not the same path coming back because in getting to 1.5 to 2, you've added additional problems in. So the path back is much more difficult than the path up. And I think that's totally neglected in the current uh, discussion. When will we get to two degrees? Um, well, Jim Hansen's chart, which I showed you, says 2040 to 2050. We have got continuing high emissions. We are having decreasing aerosols, um, not only from reduced shipping, but because China and, and others are trying to... Uh, clean up their dirtiest coal-fired high sulfate, whole high sulfate um, power stations. So we may have a terrible combination of high emissions and low aerosols, leading to an increased warming rate. Um, are we get, are we going to get past two degrees? The answer is to me obviously yes. Uh, people may remember that Shell and Hoover et al. maybe five, six years ago, put out a very simple paper called the Carbon Law, which said if you wanted any hope of holding warm into two degrees, you had to halve emissions every decade between 2020 and 2030. And then again, between 2030 and 2040, plus some drawdown. Now, we are not within cooey of halving emissions by 2030. Um, they're likely to be where they are now. Um, the Earth's energy imbalance is uh, at the top of the atmosphere um, was measured at about one watt, watt per square metre, published by Ron Schuchman in 2019 and by NASA. Now, 1.5 is 0.75 degrees, but that was before the sulphate burst. I mean, the energy imbalance globally now might be close to two, which would imply another one and a half degrees of warming at equilibrium for the current level of greenhouse gases. So I think we're going to burst through two degrees. Uh, and when system feedbacks and cascades are accounted for, which are now becoming active, I mean, you know, the significant evidence that the Amazon, for example, a great carbon store has is now already becoming a, a net emitter, a source of carbon rather than a sink of carbon. Um, the same may be true for the boreal forests. So we are getting uh, system feedbacks that will lead to increased warming. And in fact, in, in a really good piece of work done two years ago, Chatham House, the UK premier international affairs uh, think tank, did a climate risk assessment and they decided uh, to uh, include what they called a, pl a plausible high-end scenario, which is frightening. And they said that could be 3.5 degrees plus. So I certainly think that's sort of three to 3.5 is probably where the system is heading at the moment, given the political uh, momentum. Um, the next point, which is coming out in the literature, but which is not understood, is that two to, if you get to two degrees of warming, it's not a point of system stability. This is clear from the paleo climate um, uh, data and Johan Rockström, and now the head of the Potsdam Institute has done a lot of the, of the work on, on tipping points and so on. And I'll quote because he says, quote, if we go beyond two degrees, it is very likely that we have caused so many tipping points that you have probably added another degree just through self-reinforcing changes, unquote. And Sheldon Hoover, uh, in a similar vein, said, and I'll quote, if the climate system tipping points interact and cascades develop, then the heating could become independent, that is self-sustaining at two degrees, it would mean the end of human civilization. So the point is that people are saying, well, maybe we can hold warming to two degrees. Two degrees is not a point of system stability. If you get to two degrees, it's a signpost to something much hotter further down the road. Um, I think last year it became really clear uh, in the literature that system level change and tipping points are, are happening, as uh, Jason Box said, faster than forecast. Uh, when he, you know, produced some fairly compelling evidence that, that Greenland had passed its tipping points, there was more evidence about those uh, critical West Antarctic glaciers, particularly Thwaites being past their tipping points. And I think the, you know, the really key thing to think about is that we clearly have tipping points for 
the cryosphere at both poles for um, coral reefs. Um, our, our coral system, the Great Barrier Reef, is three quarters dead already um, for the Amazon. And that those tipping points have occurred at less than the current level of warming, which is 1.1 to 1.2. So the discussion we get in policy making, and that was in the IPCC report again last week, that where they say, if we get to 1.5 degrees, things will be bad, is wrong. Critical tipping points have already been passed at the current level of warming. And, and of course, the literature that's, that's come out uh, more and more now is talking about those, the cascades of tipping points uh, of the, the non-linear and underestimated relationships um, that are not yet incorporated into into in, into climate models. Those that those relationships where, for example, the um, the loss of Arctic sea ice is is helping to increase the, the the speed of Greenland ice melt. The Greenland ice melt pouring a lot of uh, of fresh water into North Atlantic is slowing down uh, the Gulf Stream. The slowing of the Gulf Stream is leading to less rainfall over eastern Amazon and 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 drying and increased fires. So we're starting to see those tipping points um, happen, uh, which of course why in you know one of the most downloaded papers in history, uh, people like Rockstrom and Shellen Huber and 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 so on um, talked about uh, a hot house earth scenario where those tipping points uh, become irreversible and start to build upon each other, and in fact. Um, Last year, Will Steffen, you know, a great Australian scientist who unfortunately died um, earlier this year and was one of the, the pioneers of Earth system uh, science thinking and of uh, the concept of the great acceleration and, and of the Anthropocene. In a chapter of her book last year, he, he said, and I'll just quote, the current trajectory is accelerating the Earth towards a point of bifurcation with the increasing risk that our pressures will push the system onto the hothouse earth trajectory. The critical point here is that there is a point beyond which we lose control of the system and its own, own internal feedbacks drive it past a global threshold and irreversibly into a, mot, uh, a much hotter state. So, I mean, look, all of that science is out there, what I've just talked about, anybody can read, but unfortunately, um, uh, some of us understand it well, but in the policy making uh, global sphere, these ideas are, I think, suppressed or overwhelmed by quite fallacious ideas about carbon budgets and keeping to 1.5 and incremental change and so on. And I mean, the really obvious conclusion from, from what I've just said is that cooling the planet is now vital. It's, in fact, it's the most vital thing that we need to do now. I mean, David King, talking about Sir David King, the former UK chief scientist, talking about the Arctic, has says what we do in the Arctic in the next two or three years will determine the future of humanity. And I mean, I think he's right that that cooling the planet is vital if we are going to keep warming below a level where more system tipping points are activated and cascade into an avalanche of warming and, and feedbacks that will take our human actions uh, beyond our capacity to, to rein in. So, I mean, I guess what I've talked about today is, is trying to communicate fairly clearly and in simple terms and with a few graphs, the sort of evidence which I think you can present to a fairly broad public audience about the need for cooling. And can I just finish with um, a paper put out by uh, some researchers in Australia led by Andrew King at the University of Melbourne last year. It was called preparing for a, net, a post net zero world. And in there, they said, and I will quote, from a geologic perspective, a justifiable aim for a future climate is one akin to pre-industrial conditions. And I mean, I think what we're seeing now about dangerous climate change at just over one degree really reinforces that point. And I think that's my 20 minutes or a couple of minutes more than 20 minutes. Thanks, Kaiser. Yeah, indeed. And I think we at MIR certainly agree heating is what we are trying very hard to address. Um, so next we are going to bring on a couple of people from our MIR community who would like to ask you a, a question or two. And just a reminder to our audience, you can send questions to Eric Schreiner in the chat um, co-host. So first we'll bring on Rebecca Gordon. 
Rebecca Gordon is an architect who is researching how the built environment can be designed to help us transition from being net destroyers of resources to being planetary stewards. She is designing a cooling mesh fabric made from used aluminum cans. Thanks for coming, Rebecca. Hi. Hi, David, Mr. Spratt, Hi. Professor Spratt. Uh, no, no, not professor. No. Um, I basically, I feel like my question was kind of answered by your brief talk there, but um, I wanted to ask uh, as a generalist, what do you think the effects of an ice free Arctic Ocean will be? Um, the, the, the question of the Arctic is really problematic because, as I said, in 2007, there was what was called a big melt, uh, where the amount of, of ice uh, cover, um, that very thin layer of ice, you know, half a meter to three meters thick that fluxes across the ocean, uh, uh, Arctic Ocean between summer and winter gets larger and smaller, rapidly dropped. And as I said, then people said, oh, this is 100 years ahead of schedule, but it was it was right on schedule. I mean, it's really clear that uh, scientists have said, for example, that if you lost the the all the ice, the sea ice cover in summer, that would be equivalent to another 25 years of emissions at the current rate. So that's, you know, more, that would be equivalent to another half a degree of warming because that reflective ice, which is kicking uh, uh, incoming radiation back into space would be, would be replaced by dark sea, which absorbs it, takes in a lot more heat. And it's, it's inconceivable. And I think Jim Hansen's just about the only person who's ever said it, that when we get to um, uh, an ice-free, uh, or what is called a blue ice circumstances in summer in the Arctic, and it's, it's when, unless there is dramatic cooling in the Arctic quickly, if you have those summers without sea ice, there is no possibility of the Grand Land ice sheet being stable. If there's no sea ice, then you have lost Greenland. And when you have lost Greenland, you have slowed down uh, the Gulf Stream to a significant extent that will fundamentally change the, the, um, uh, the climate in Europe, actually make it cooler. Uh, and North America, because uh, there's less heat being transported from the uh, from the equator up up uh, in, into the North Atlantic. So the, there are the most fundamental consequences for the loss of Arctic sea ice. That's where it gets confusing to me because if if we're heating everything up, and then you just said that it would make Europe cooler. It's so confusing. I, I don't, it's hard to understand like what well, well, the, the interaction system, of those two, what well, is the it Earth system, to our food? The Earth system is, you know, it's a very complex system. And what we're talking about is the transfer of heat around the planet. I mean, one of the things we've seen, for example, with with the heating in the Arctic is there is a, a circulatory system, the jet stream, uh, which really r runs around at a subpolar level and separates the Arctic from Northern Hemisphere weather. And with global warming, that jet stream has destabilized. So what you're getting is these big curls or S-bends in the jet stream, which it means that record amounts of heat from Europe and North America is getting into the Arctic. And likewise, record amounts of coal are bursting out of the Arctic into North America and Europe and producing these extreme conditions. So people locally might be experiencing a really unusually cold conditions, but within the context of the whole planet heating. And likewise, with the, with the Gulf Stream, I mean, this is this great ocean circulatory system, uh, which, uh, tr which, which transports heat from the Caribbean, from the tropical Atlant Atlantic and through the ocean, carries huge amounts of heat. Up the up the east coast of of, of North America, um, uh, and then across to Europe, and keeps that climate warmer than it would otherwise be. So, ironically, you can have um, a, a planet that is hotter, but where some places cool because the circulatory system is moving heat and cold from one place to another. So, the basis is that it would still the overall planet would still be hotter. We, we, well, yes, I mean. 
if you get to three degrees, for example, um, you're go basically going to have perhaps a slightly cooler Europe or North American summer, but the desertification of the dry subtropics. So you will see at the same time, you may see um, the Sahara jumping the Mediterranean into Spain and Italy and Greece. Uh, so these are the these are the contradictions. I mean, really, the desertification that, when you think about it across Central Asia, I mean, through the Middle East, through Iran, um, through the Central Asian republics, and into China, will have them. I mean, horrendous consequences for food production in that part of the world because the the and 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 to northern for other parts of the world, parts of Africa as well. There's incredible drying. That will simply mean that food production will not be viable uh, in a significant number of nations. I could go on, but I'll pass the baton. I don't want to hog up too much time. Thank you so much. Thank you, mm -hmm. Rebecca. Yeah, and we do have a few questions coming in from the general audience. Um, but I think before that, we're going to bring on Bruce Douglas. And I'll just say a few words about Bruce. Bruce Douglas is a nationally respected environmental engineer, hydrogeologist, and soil scientist. He has 40 years of experience in water resource management at the project municipal, state, and regional level in the United States and abroad. Great. Thank you, Kaza. Coming. And, and David, thank you for that a very useful talk. It, it sounds, I mean, it's clear that politicians are using the IPCC's recommendations for cover almost mm -hmm. and saying, if we, if, you know, if we just follow this, we'll be okay. And they don't even follow that. Uh, <laughs> but at least it, it gives them a, a um, ability to set a lower target than what you're saying mm -hmm. is realistic based on a, a real risk centered approach um mm -hmm. so any two-part question one any do you have any success, successful stories of folks that have been able to successfully communicate the real level of risk and, and mm -hmm. get political change and then two is for cooling any thoughts on and we're going to need a lot of methods of cooling amir is has one, um, but any, any thoughts of any uh, additional uh, technologies they think are promising it, for this next two to three years where we really have a, um, a lot of work to do? Uh, thanks, Bruce. I mean, last week I did a little blog because I was so mad at this IPCC report that was released a couple of weeks ago, the latest summary for policymakers, and people can find that blog on... Um, climatecodered.org, climatecodered.org. And I mean, sometimes it takes a while for the penny to drop with me. And I was just thinking about this summary for policymakers because the IPCC process is highly political. I mean, a hun the, the ambassadors or diplomats from 195 countries get together and they appoint the lead authors. So the, the process is politicized from the start. But when that that scientific work is done and it comes back to those diplomats to produce what's called the summary for policymakers. It is those diplomats who vote sentence by sentence on what's going to be in the summary for policymakers. And their explicit goal is to make the summary for policymakers relevant to the political process. Now, the people who are voting on making it relevant to the political process are the political process themselves. So there's this whole separate self-referential system where climate diplomats vote on what is relevant for them to make policy on. I mean, this is, this is a delusional circle. Uh, and as I said, things like carbon budgets and integrated assessment models, which are now at the core of the IPCC, are an artifice of bad risk management. If you had sensible risk management, you say you want a 90 or 95% chance of not exceeding two degrees or 1.5 degrees, there would be no carbon budget. The answer would be that we should have been at zero yesterday, which you know I think is, is obvious to all of that. So this is the problem. Is that being understood? I mean, I had a, a senior uh, Australian climate scientist who's been involved in the IPCC email me yesterday and said, your article last week was correct. I mean, I think 
if you look at the sort of papers, the sort of things that John Schellenhuber and, and science in Europe are saying, you know, when Schellenhuber says, when the risks are existential, conventional forms of scientific analysis may be useless. I mean, he's talking about the IPCC there. So I think there is, you know, there is a growing uh, community. I mean, the Extinction Rebellion, uh, Rebellion scientists, I think they get it as well. If you look at the response from the UN Secretary General last week, he was so strong in what he said. You know, so I think there is a, a growing awareness and there's a, a growing awareness in, in the literature that the IPCC is, 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 is no good. I mean, I remember when there was that uh, IPCC report in 2007, which said that sea level rises to 2100 might be half a degree. Jim Hansen, I mean, the, the godfather of modern climate science, um, wrote a fabulous paper, uh, peer-reviewed paper called Sea Level Rise and Scientific Reticence. So I think in the scientific community, there is a lot of understanding that the IPCC is, is a highly politicized process, but because it's run by diplomats, uh, on behalf of governments, for governments, to create the illusion that incremental change is still feasible and viable, um, that 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 tends to overwhelm the more dry scientific material. As for your question about cooling, um, it's not an area of great expertise for me. I've always accepted that it's absolutely necessary and it's now more necessary than ever. Um, um, I did an interview last year with a guy called John Moore, who's looking at, at, at seabed curtains to try and slow the um, release of, um, uh, uh, that slow down glaciers, whether they've been in Greenland or in West Antarctica, a physical process to try and stop the ice mass loss. Um, uh, so David King and his group in, in the UK with some others, and I, I think he's been talking to George Soros by the look at some things that George Soros said recently, is saying that cooling the Arctic is is an absolute priority. And I think that's I think that's true for the for the, the question that Rebecca asked. That if you lose the sea ice in summer and you trigger the sort of events in Greenland and their consequences, we're going to get system cascades that we simply can't unwind because of the hysteresis in the system. So trying to slow down Arctic cooling is is important. I mean, I know they're looking at a number of things including regional sulfates, but also marine cloud brightening, where you essentially put misty salt water up into the atmosphere to try and increase the cloud cover, uh, which which ha has a cooling effect. But um, it's not, an, I mean, it's an area that I've read about and written, written about a lot, but others would probably know, know more about the, the cooling options than, than, than I do. I mean, I would simply say that I think any cooling uh, proposal, whether it's global or regional or polar, that that is scalable, that is economically doable, and it is and is of net social and ecological environment should be done. I don't think we have to pick between. We need every cooling process that that is feasible and ethical, because that's the point we're at now. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Well, this question that's come in from the audience kind of dovetails off of, off of that. Do you think that scientific predictions consider the impact of carbon dioxide removal? Um, you know, is that being taken into account or do you think it's just, you know, the predictions don't even include that? Well, I think there's the you know there's two sorts. There's obviously the science that really looks at uh, at at the, at the physics and chemistry of the atmosphere and how much we put up there and the warming consequences. Then there are those really tricky beasts called integrated assessment models, which are a combination of uh, uh, some science, the energy system, and the economic system. And integrated assessment models produce scenarios, which is really just a modeler says, I think the following will happen. I think that by 2050, we can draw down 7 billion tonnes of CO2 a year, or we can have um, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is basically saying, we're going to pay the oil industry to fill all the wells that they've emptied of oil and gas, which have ruined the climate, we're now going to pay them an even larger amount of money to pump compressed CO2 back into those wells. Now, you can, 
I mean, you can imagine, and these some of these scenarios have really huge amounts of these things in there. Um, for example, the um, the global banking system uh, in an organization called the um, Network for Greening the Financial System, which may be a large misnomer, um, uh, put out a set of scenarios two years ago, and they had their optimum scenario was called net zero 2050, like everybody is, that's that's the mantra. When you looked at that that net zero 2050 scenario, 40% of the energy was still coming from fossil fuels, the primary energy was still coming from fossil fuels because they had assumed all this BECS and drawdown and carbon capture and storage. So, I mean, I'm just saying that integrated assessment models can be technological imaginaries where you can imagine whatever technologies you want to in order to get the sums to add up. So um, I think the question is, I mean, undoubtedly, you know, we should have been at zero yesterday. There's no carbon budget. That's not negotiable. Do we need to draw down? Yes, as much as possible. And that's the problem with the net zero um, methodology is that rather than using drawdown to reduce atmospheric CO2, we're using it as, as offsets for keeping on burning um, uh, fossil fuels. So do we need draw down? Absolutely. What are the most plausible, feasible forms in the first instance restoring degraded wetlands and rainforests. That's the quickest way to produce drawdown before you get into more high-tech uh, models. I mean, drawdown to me, uh, uh, like cooling, is that we should spend a lot of money and a lot of research really, really quickly, um, uh, like the Manhattan Project, parallel research projects. Don't think about the ideas sequentially. Think, think about them all at the one time in parallel teams. See what works. Put a lot of money into seeing what's feasible and go for it. Um, so I'm not saying it should be restricted to, to, to natural drawdown, but um, you know, the, the, the question is what is feasible at scale? And that's still tricky because a lot of the drawdown, some of them uh, um, obviously work. I mean, algal farming and, and, and restoring ocean systems, which can, can hold a lot of CO2 is obviously really important as well as rainforests and wetlands. But um, um, so on the one hand, I don't think enough money is being put into drawdown. On the other hand, there are all sorts of imaginings in, in, in scenarios that drawdown is going to allow a lot more emissions for uh, a long period to come. So it's sort of a bit of a mixed story, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, and um, I think, you know, there was a comment about carbon di dioxide removal requires more energy than the energy that it removes. And of course, mm -hmm. it depends on what kind you're talking about, like what you were just saying with the yeah. restoring, you know, the wetlands and so forth. Yeah. Um, okay, well, here's, here's, so maybe we'll turn a little bit to around heat Michael is wondering if you might want to address some of the risks that come with geoengineering. And of course, well, there are, you know, that's a big word that means a lot of different things. Yeah. Well, I mean, the geoengineering debate for many years was focused almost exclusively on, on putting uh, sulfates into the atmosphere. I mean, that, that, that's, what, that's what's caused all the controversy. Uh, that's what's sort of caught all the trouble about geoengineering, but there are many forms of geoengineering. Mia is involved in, in you know, research and advocacy and testing, which don't have any of those problems. So I don't think there's one ethical debate about geoengineering. I think there, there are ethical debates about the various solutions, and they range from their efficacy. Um, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the analysis that machines that draw CO2 from the atmosphere may, may use more energy than, than they help to save is, is obviously, obviously, you know, um, a fairly damning critique at the moment of the, the technological development of, of those things. As far as, as um, putting sulfates in the upper atmosphere, I mean, I think the thing about it is that one, it's feasible because humans have been doing it for a long time. We've just seen in this talk, you know, the effect of withdrawing sulfates from the atmosphere through the cleaning up of shipping emissions, you know, is, is going to prompt another half a degree or one degree of warming. So we know that sulfates work. I mean, they also cause acid rain, which, which, which damage the health of a lot of people. Uh, so it's not a question of whether it's feasible. It's not a question of its cost, because uh, it's relatively low cost, which is why it's attractive. It's a question of, of whether it's of net social and economic 
uh, benefit, uh, of net social and environmental benefit. And there obviously are, um, are trade-offs. Um, I think, practically speaking, the problem will be, and, and um, you know, it's, this has been a, a subject of, of, of um, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's, some of Kim Stanley Robinson's books, uh, recent books, where he says, you know, people say there's not global governance, there's not global agreements. And, and he has a scenario where things get so bad in India and so hot that the Indian government decides to do it. And they have the capacity to do it because they've got an air force, which is all you need. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I, I think we can have, you know, debates about the ethics of it and, and, and that's tricky. Uh, but the, the practicalities are is if it gets hot enough and people and governments can see millions of people being displaced or sitting on their borders unable to eat, then governments will do desperate things. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so and so the discussion about it is about that and, and, and other cooling technologies, it's got to be, you know, uh, it's, it's got, the, the discussion about the ethics and the plausibility and the efficacy is, is, is as important as putting a huge amount of money into both drawdown and, and, and direct cooling interventions now. I mean, in some ways, those tasks are as important as a mitigation task. If we, you know, if we don't cool the planet, actually cool the planet, then I think the hothouse earth scenario will kick in. I mean, in the evidence I tried to give today, we're going to shoot past 1.5. There is nothing in the emissions trajectory which says that we won't get well past two. You've got Rockstrom and Schellnerhuber saying, if you get to two, you'll get to three. Um, 15 years ago, you had US uh, intelligence analysts saying, if you, got to three degree, if you got to three degrees, in a great report called The Age of Consequences, they, did, they said, if you get to three degrees, the world may be characterized by the term outright chaos. And I think that's that's correct. So, you know, cooling can no longer be a, a theoretical discussion. It's a practical necessity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not used, not used to this audience, I know. <laughs> um, okay. Well, since you mentioned about, you know, the hothouse earth scenario, there's a very specific question. Bear with me for a moment here. Adrian has written in curious about your reaction to the review paper, if you know about it, um, the Wang and others in February, it's called Mechanisms and Impacts of Earth System Tipping Elements, which concluded that by 20, this is a quote, by 2100, the additional warming from these tipping elements is about 0.13 degrees Celsius under the model SSP to 4.5 and about 0.21 degrees Celsius under the model SSP 5 8.8.5 relative to the original scenarios. Yes, I was another quote about the sum effect of these near term tipping elements is significant in our model, but secondary to the larger emissions trajectory. It thus seems unlikely that this additional warming is sufficient to self perpetuate global scale climate change independent of the human emissions pathway. So they're seeming to yeah. discard yeah. the possibility of this hothouse earth scenario. I was, I was underwhelmed by that paper. And I'll explain why. Um, first of all, a lot of these systems are what have been characterized as non-linear. That is, it is not easy to uh, attach a timeline to their progression. I mean, we've seen, as I've talked about, how in past IPCC reports and as the climate science literature has developed, that things are happening faster than forecast. Mm -hmm. So the models are always be, seem to be behind what's going on. So I don't think models are really a really a really good uh, view into the future because they've been not very good uh, 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 in the past. Um, you know, I, I do papers coming out saying, "Oh, our model shows that you know sea level rise will be you know another 0.3 of a meter by 2100, or so it could be one or 1.2 meters." But you've got the U.S. Department of Defense with a two meter sea level rise scenario. Um, uh, the second problem is that models don't can't emulate a whole lot of processes. Models are not very good at ice sheet disintegration. Because of that, they're not very good at sea level rise. 
they're not very good at the permafrost. They haven't been very good about the Amazon. I mean, when these papers came out saying the Amazon has become a, a net source of carbon, everybody said, I'm shocked. None of the models said that. So when somebody produces, and then, of course, you have the interactions or the cascades, the interplay of, 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 tip, uh, of systems interacting with each other, which you talked a, a little bit about. Um, when you add those things in, I find the Wangadel paper doesn't deal with those issues. Okay, it's a model. A model is a function of the assumptions you make about the model. But I mean, I think that the history is that, and, and you know, Michael Mann saying this, models don't deal with all sorts of things. Models didn't, didn't predict the sort of extreme extremes we've had in the last two or three years. Nobody thought that the heat would be as hot as it was, that the, you know, that the storms would be as strong as they were. Uh, the models weren't good at predicting the slowdown in, in, in the, the Gulf Stream. Um, so, uh, I mean, part of the problems with the IPCC is it has been a model fetish and models are limited. They're useful, but they're limited. And I mean, one of the great criticisms that, that um, uh, people have made is that, you know, uh, apart from models, there's another really important source of um, understanding about the climate system, which is organic and real, which is the climate history, paleoclimatology. Now, and paleoclimatology uh, tells us that at equilibrium, which I know takes time, but at equilibrium, uh, 450 parts per million, and remember 420 parts per million at the moment, we're going to be at 450 probably in 15 years, 450 parts per million of CO2, even if you get rid of all the other short-lived gases, in the long run is four degrees of warming. Because that's what all the paleo data says. So people can say, oh, well, you know, our models say that, you know, we'll only have, you know, an extra point two of feedbacks by the end of the century. I mean, warming doesn't end at the end of the century. The feedbacks go on. And the paleo data says that we are heading towards three to four degrees for the current level of greenhouse gases. Hmm. Yeah. It is frightening. Well, uh, this is the physical reality that we can't negotiate. I mean, we wish the policy, I mean, the problem with policymakers is they think they can negotiate with the laws of physics and chemistry. <laughs> and then what they're doing is imperiling, <laughs> imperiling human civilization by, think, by, by thinking they're lawyers trying to get a deal. Right, with, right. With the earth system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, well, a, a grat gratitude from Eric B. Thanks to David for being a rare and trusted voice of reason for many years, given both the seemingly urgent need for geoengineering cooling and the difficulty of actually getting emissions reduced at all. Mm. Uh, Eric would like to be interested to hear more of your thoughts about risks around masking increasing emissions. Um. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, I think in many disciplines, it's outsiders can have a fresh view. And if I've added anything to the debate was that I came to this whole question 15, 20 years ago as somebody outside the scientific community. And I think that helped with some clarity. Uh, um, I, I guess your question is about, it was about masking and aerosols. So, I mean, the problem is that aerosols, mainly sulfate aerosols, are uh, very short-lived in the atmosphere, about one week. And their principal source is the, is the use and burning of fossil fuels, as we've seen with the shipping emissions. But, you know, they come from burning coal. Um, in, in fact, you know, a so-called dirty coal-fired power station has a greater sulfur content. So the dirty coal-fired power stations have the greatest temporary cooling impact. I mean, they're putting a lot of carbon dioxide out, uh, out there, but they're also putting a lot of sulfates up. So as the world cleans up the dirtiest coal-fired power station, one of the ironic consequences of that is that you're increasing the rate of short-term warming. So in the sense that we have known for a long time that um, uh, sulfates provide a short-term cooling, that is, 
Sorry if there's noise overhead. There's a whole lot of cockatoos um, flying above my head at the moment. Um, for, for as long as we've known that, that sulfates are cooling the atmosphere, we have been consciously, as a, as a society, not individually, we have been consciously geoengineering the planet by putting those sulfates up there. Um, in, in, I mean, similar to a natural process like a volcano putting up a whole lot of dust and sulfate. So it's it's not a new thing. We've been geoengineering for a long time. And you know, this is the terrible contradiction that Jim Hansen talked about. He called it the Faustian bargain that, you know, we've done this deal with the devil that we can use all these fossil fuels and, you know, fly around the world and do all the sorts of things we do. But the price we've been paying is putting up a whole lot of sulfates and we have, have to stop losing. When we, we stop using them, the masking will be undone and even huge amounts of warming will be um, revealed. And I think, you know, this that's a Faustian bargain. It's, it's not easily resolved. I mean, you know, ironically, even though they have terrible uh, health consequences, I mean, You'd be better off to keep some of the dirtiest, in in an abstract sense, to keep some of the dirtiest coal-fired power stations open to 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 to, to keep the sulphate loading high. Mm -hmm. um, but people won't do that because of acid rain. I mean, with with um, putting aerosols in the upper atmosphere, you don't get the acid rain problem because you put it much higher in the atmosphere. So, uh, I mean, I think there's an absolutely compelling need to 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 cool the planet. And the cool, the cool systems in particular, and uh, um, it's 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 a hard choice because th there are consequences, but there are also consequences from not doing it, uh, including you know the collapse of modern societies we know it. Right. Yeah. Well, here's a question that's come in about methane, and this is from a different Eric. Uh, has understanding improved regarding when the methane sequestered under the arctic will be released into the atmosphere because that is a conversation that's yeah happening, but um kind of yeah, I, I th I, sorry case i think i think understanding of methane has increased in many ways i mean i think the 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 importance of of, of methane in heating is, is uh, the, the plan is now much better understood that it's a greater proportion of heating than used to be understood years ago that it's global warming potential at a 20 year interval rather than a 100 year interval is, is actually you know really really significant um obviously the largest amounts of methane are trapped uh subpolar in the in the northern hemisphere in what are called methane uh clathrates in, in in matrices where where they're where they're um um relatively safe and you know the i guess it's one of the great sort of science fiction stories is does the methane get released <laughs> and the world as we end knows it. Um, I mean, research is being done particularly by Russian scientists on the East Siberian um, um, ice shelf in shallow waters. And they're showing that some methane is coming up uh, and bubbling up through the waters. We've seen the dramatic pictures. Um, whether that is from subsurface permafrost and relatively limited or whether it's from uh, clathrates, which would be much more serious, is, is not yet determined. So I think clathrates is, you know, obviously the big one, but I don't think that there's, comp I don't think there's compelling evidence. That's not to say it's not happening, but I don't think there's compelling evidence yet that clathrates at the moment are a serious problem. Hmm. Not saying that we don't know or that they won't be, but I don't think the evidence is there and it's not something I talk about a lot because there are so many other things where we have much more compelling evidence. And, you know, in all of us, as you know, in, in trying to communicate climate, we've got to find stories that connect with people and find evidence which is which is viable. And I don't think we have to speculate because there's 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 enough evidence out there that we can get our grips into, really, really get our, 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 our hands around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's a question from James that has to do with, and this is maybe also a question of evidence. Um, we had someone, uh, uh, Simone Michaud, Simon Michaud, on actually several months ago, who has who wrote assessment of the extra capacity required of alternative electrical energy power systems to completely repla replace fossil fuels. 
so you know the study basically concluded that we don't have sufficient rare earth metals and minerals to build the needed amount of renewable infrastructure that's something we haven't really talked mm. about today yet but you know this idea of renewable infrastructure and storage capacity to generate the same amount of power that we currently mm. receive from fossil fuels so um james is interested in hearing your thoughts about this you know seeming insufficiency <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, all of that. Look, I, I'm aware that there is a hotly contested debate about this. Mm -hmm. And I've read, you know, polemics from both sides. And I, you know, I, I, I've read the material that, that, that you have presented. I've ha heard other people saying it's not soundly based uh, and so on. I am not an expert in that area, so I really can't comment. Um, um, I wish I knew the answer, but uh, I mean, I think that there's another issue about whether we have enough rare minerals uh, uh, to, to, to do it all is a, a broader question of, of resource limits. Because, you know, the, the planet is now using one and a half, as you define it, uh, planets of resources every year. We are, we, are, we are degrading the planet's basic systems, including its topsoil and so on, by, uh, as um, Tim Lenton and Rockstrom have talked about, about... Uh, uh, producing beyond planetary boundaries uh, and when we wrote climate code red we said this was a climate and a sustainability emergency in that we actually have to get uh, i mean there was a report from the un a couple of weeks ago saying that by 2030 they think there will be a 40 percent deficiency in potable water around the planet the amount of potable water available will be 40 percent less than the minimum average requirement for people to live a healthy life. So, I mean, we have got resource depletion across a whole wide range of systems, soils and, and earth and so on, as well as, as rare metals. Um, I think uh, related to this is, is a slightly broader question about how quickly you can get to zero. And it's obviously clear that the, the quickest way to reduce emissions is to reduce demand for energy. It's much quicker to reduce demand than it is to build a new system with rare metals and so on. Um, and uh, uh, Oxfam and Kevin Anderson has taken up this, this story, has said if the 10% of the world's population uses is responsible for 50% of the emissions. And they said there's a really simple proposition, which I just find so compelling. They said, if you took the emissions being consumed by the world's 10 percent of highest users and reduced their emissions use to the european union average which is not that low it's a lot lower than australia united states it's about a third of australia united states because we're both profligate but if the top 10 percent of people reduce their consumptions and their emissions use to the eu average then global emissions tomorrow would drop by one third. Wow. Because they're using half and, and you cut their emissions by two thirds, you, you've lost one third of demand for, for fossil fuels. So, I mean, I think that's the other side of this coin. And not only can we produce such a big electricity system and infrastructure, but can we reduce the demand so we don't need it? And and in in if the in and 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 if the hyper consumption of that percent of the world, and I'm talking about you and me, and probably most of the people on this call, is not reduced, there's no way the rest of the world is going to buy into any global deal about climate change. When it when the system when when what's happening now is so inequitable, I mean, and that's one of the problems with carbon budgets. People say, oh, we've got to reduce the carbon budget back to zero. But we're not all we're not all equal in this. I mean, the highest emitting countries need to get to zero faster than the low emitting countries, because we spent a hundred years of emissions building, you know, roads and infrastructure and houses, and 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 the developing countries haven't. So there's an equity issue issue in this as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, we'll just have a couple of closing questions. Uh, this is some something from Ken. Ken has noted that there's been, you know, that you've spoken a lot about, or there's been a lot of talk about what we can do, what leaders can do. Um, Ken is curious about what you think, how to get action 
how how to make things happen? Uh, that's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> Look, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think, I think the discussion is changing, as I said, compared to 15 or 20 years ago. You know, there are a lot of scientists, whether they be extinction rebellion scientists doing direct action or, you know, people in Europe like Sheldon Huber saying conventional science may be useless. I think at that level, the, the world is changing. I think if you listen to the UN Secretary General, the world is changing. I mean, in its own ironic way, I mean, even the World Economic Forum put out its risk analysis for this, uh, for 2023. And their top six risks 10 years from now, the top six were all climate related. So I think there, I mean, I think there is some understanding that intellectual level that, you know, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, we are getting uh, out of the grips of that sort of NGO advocacy where it's all slow and incremental and we work with political parties. I think the, you know, the, the rise of, of the youth movement of what Greta Thunberg has helped to inspire the climate mobilization in the United States, extinction rebellion, people you know, just getting angry and really having a crack has really opened the Overton window a lot. And I think those sort of uh, actions where people say, we don't believe this political process is working. We're not going to be nice. We're not going to go. We're not going to go and have cups of teas with a senator. Uh, we're going to be at the front of his office, bloody demanding change. I, I think that's really healthy, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 to significantly change the conversation. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, I think we'll close. I have a curiosity myself about um, what you know what you are inclined to say to youth. And when you, you know, when you're, when you come across them when, in your life, in your work, you know, what, uh, yeah. What, what? Well, I mean, I guess I do two things. One is, I think you have to be brutally honest about the problem when, I mean, when risks are existential, I mean, whether it's nuclear war or whatever, there's no point doing the soft shoe parade you, you you've got to say it like it is and that's that's disheartening and and um uh i say you know just just go for it now just whatever you think you need to do go go and do it the next five years counts the most you know um you can build a career and be a climate diplomat in 30 years time that's going to be irrelevant it's it's what you do here and now that's the most important. So um, uh, in, in a world of sort of social media and, and hyper individualism, I just say collective action, get together with others, find, find common cause with others, find common cause with, with others, make a lot of noise, be heard, be disruptive, cause trouble. That was my youth a bit. So, you know. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us at Mere Talk today. It's been really good to hear, you know, reality checks on things. Thank you very much, Kaiser, and uh, all, all power to the work that you're doing. It's so essential, all of you. Thank you. And thank you to those of us who have joined today. At MIR, we are working to help educate the public while also developing solutions to warming the planet. We invite you to keep learning. Um, you can go to our website, MIR.org. We are an almost 100% volunteer staff with just a few paid people at the moment, and we'd love you to consider making a monthly donation if you can. You can also visit our YouTube channel, which is Mir SRM, and we have a Facebook page. So check all of that out. And we want to remind you about next month, we will be, we will be meeting up on Sunday, May 7th. That's of course, Eastern time. And we thank you, those of us who have joined, um, you know, in Australia today, who already in the next day, but we are uh, Eastern time. 2 p.m. Sunday, May 7th, and looking forward to that. So thanks again for coming. Wishing everybody well. Bye for now. <laughs>